It's right here. Yeah, because there's an arm. There's an arm, there's another arm, there's another one. Parents have some concerns of some stuff they may have found in your room? Yeah, I believe so. And what would it be? A human head and hands. Now, when one is John, what's the address emergency? Hi, there is an emergency. I found, found something in my son's closet wrapped in a plastic bag. Okay, what was it? I think it's a human head. It's a what? I think it's a human head. On March 1st, 2021, Police at Grand Junction, Colorado received this chilling 911 call. A mother has just discovered a disturbing secret hidden within her son's closet. Even more terrifying, he's currently just outside the house while she makes this call for help. Why do you think it's that? Because it looks like it's all an ear. Is it all, is it bloody or does it like anything like that? Can you just come? Do I have to take a picture and send it to you? What's you the just address? Come? The dispatcher tries to get as much information as possible to make sense of this shocking call and give officers an idea of what they might be walking into. Is your son there now? He just pulled up. We wanted to make sure he was here before we called. How old is he? 19. He's had a little bit of a fascination with the morbid, but he was channeling it, I thought, into becoming a crime scene investigator, but not so much. Do you think he's going to be cooperative with us? I don't know. I don't think he'll be violent. Okay. Just came back from his son's house. Does he have any weapons in his room, or do you guys have any in the house? I don't know. I think that he has a shotgun, but we can certainly remove it immediately before he gets in his room. He's out by the car now, so. Is the bag still in the closet? No, it's in my kitchen sink. And there's a secondary bag that I have not opened. It's currently covered with a towel. And there's a it's second bag? Taking, yeah, there's a second bag. Though. I don't know what's in it. I didn't open it. I'm oh, sorry. Did you take, the, you take the second bag out of the closet? I took the second bag out of the closet and put it in the sink. Where's Brian now? I think he's still outside. And you're in the backyard now? I am, yes, because I don't want him to hear me. Despite the horrifying nature of this call, Police could not have anticipated the twisted tale of violence they were about to embark on, nor did they have any idea just how shocking the motive behind the inexplicable horror would be. One day prior to responding to this harrowing incident, the emergency services had attended to a rather unusual call at 2 a.m. on Sunday, February 28, 2021. 19-year-old Brian Cohey Jr. is having a bad night, as officers arrive at the Blue Heron boat ramp, they can scarcely believe their eyes. The majority of the following footage has never been seen before. It's been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed professional counselor, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a former detective, former licensed polygraph examiner, and former hostage negotiation commander and instructor. How can we call a tow for that? I don't know, because he'd have to get in the friggin' water. Yeah. I caught Black's towing. They want me to text them a photo of the car because they think they might be able to pull it out. Okay. Um, so you already have, you're already in contact well, with them? Yeah, but I have, I only have like 10% battery left on my phone and now he wants me to text him a photo of the car and I'm okay. like, oh good lord. <laughs> um, I can take one and text it to him for you if you'd like. Oh, that would be fantastic. Thank you. It's not every day that police officers see a car floating in the Colorado River. To try and make sense of what they're observing, the officers speak to Brian's mother. He uh, is an inexperienced driver. Okay. He's crying here on the angle. And he got out and like, just looked around for a moment. And when he went to get back in, he wasn't able, because of the angle, to pull it out. I don't know. He's, he's right there. Okay, we'll talk, talk to him real quick. Bye. Sounds Bye. good. Officers decide it's best to get the story straight from the horse's mouth and 19-year-old Brian has no choice but to own up to his mistake. Little do these officers know, there's a sinister secret lurking in the background of this crazy story. Is this your son right here? Yep. Hey, partner, you wanna come out and talk to me real quick? Sure, I Appreciate mean, it, I'm really cold. Is it's it okay if it's in here? Because it's fine. Pants he had okay. That's fine, I did, I did not know that. No, yeah. that's, please, please, 
Please stay in the car. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Nobody else in the car. No. Nope. Okay. No, just us. I'm the father. That's the mother. And this is our son. He just like Sounds parked good. 20 minutes ago and said, "Dad, I parked at the boat ramp and I messed up. He's I tried like, to get out of the car and it slid down." Well, you're not hurt, right? You're okay. No, just a okay. little cold is all. Side your pride a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and probably seven thousand dollars. Okay. All right, man. Um, do you have your ID with you, driver's license, by any chance? Thankfully. What were you doing down here, bud? Well, I felt like I needed to get out, like, okay. and I figured, why not park here and just... Just relax a little just bit? Just relax and think. Okay. And I parked on the boat ramp, okay. and I thought it would be easy to get out. Uh -huh. But when I tried to... Where I did you it... park exactly? Were you down the hill a little I bit? Was, yeah, just a little bit. Okay. And then... When you got I, back in... Go ahead. When I got back in... I tried to put it in drive, mm -hmm. and it didn't go up. So then I tried putting it in low gear, shimmying it a bit. That didn't work. Were you facing down? No, I was facing. I was facing up. You you and we you back down? Yeah. That's a really good because idea. That's... It's a predicament so ridiculous that the responding officers can't help but laugh. How ideas. we're gonna handle this, man? <laughs> I do I get a tow going for a car in the river and see if anybody will take this? I'm going to work on that. I don't brother. know, man. So I'm kind of glad you were coming down here because I was like, uh, it's not a crash. He just Dude, it's like parked it out in the water. He How parked it and basically couldn't get it up. It just lost traction, looks like. And then he, he actually went in it I just, down I, in the water. He's not hurt at all. So I'm like, <laughs> how are you going to get this car out if possible? I don't know. The officers are convinced that this is a teenager's mishap. It will be some time before they begin to suspect that there's anything more to this story than what they've been told. We're going to get some options for you here, man. I'm not sure exactly if we're going to, we're going to see if we can go through the list if anybody's got some ideas on getting this car out of here okay. or not. I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah, she's talking seen to a whole now. lot of uh, cars that have wants. put themselves in that situation. So we're going to yeah, yeah. see what we can do. And, I'm, I'm, uh, not, I'm actually the owner of the, of the life jacket program on the, on the boat ramp here. Mm -hmm. I do okay. all the life jackets all right. in That's Grand Junction, Colorado. So it's cool. like, oh my God, I'm, <laughs> this is not... It happens. Think, yeah. It happens. Faced with embarrassment over the whole ordeal, Brian's mother talks with the officers. Yeah, we made him wait till he was almost 18 before he got his driver's <laughs> license because we didn't want him having any accidents like they do when they're 16 and 17. And gotcha. Stupid things. <laughs> but stupid is he doesn't have any issue with it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to lie, this is my first time too. Really? <laughs> it's a new one for me. What's that? So I've never seen one of these either, so it's a new one for me. On my, on my website, backing up, when people back up their boats, I see the accidents where, they, when the truck goes accidentally in the water. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, the boat and the truck's in the water. But... <laughs> Lost him. Just let me know if he does, that way, if, if not, we can try and get hold of a tow truck and okay. go from there. No, it's at an angle. It's heading upriver. It's facing upriver. Yeah. Yes, the, for, the front of it is facing upriver. Oh, damn it. I'm sorry. It keeps losing the call. Ah! <laughs> and he's like, I don't want to get wet. <laughs> I don't have the proper clothing to go gotcha. into the water and get wet. Yeah. Hey, Robert. Well, you know, I, just, I was just talking to the patrolman, and they're suggesting that we just adjust this in daylight hours. <laughs> That's why they make the big bucks. They're smart. Nobody, nobody wants to get in the water. I hear you. <laughs> At long last, the officers make contact with the towing company willing to come out to the river in the middle of the night and risk the frigid waters. With help on the way, they finish things up with the Cohees. If you guys want to stay warm, you're more than welcome to jump in that car and does, stay where it's warm. Does he need to stay here? <laughs> I'm sorry? Is, he, is he free to go? He would, I'm sure he'd like to go home and get warm. <laughs> I'm sure he'd like to get some pants on. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I, it's not a crash. It's... Okay, this is a stupid ass. Nope. So. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take him home then, and then we'll come back here and figure out what's what with the <laughs> Terry and Brian Sr. take Brian home, but they soon return without their son to the boat ramp. Nearly an hour later, the tow company is making progress. But as the car nears the shore, the officers make a disconcerting discovery. Hey, quick question for you. Sure. So the back bumper, I don't know, you can probably see it from here. It's a lot of red on the back of that, dripping down it all a little bit. But underneath the license plate, a little area right there. Okay. Okay. A lot of red, which means it looks like blood. Blood? Yeah. 
don't know if your, did your son hurt himself on his I way out know. at all? He might have. He just didn't know it. I don't know. That's a good. That's why I'm asking. That's a good question. He's at home. Is he make sure he's not got a cut or he's just said he's going to bed. something out on him somewhere that he's not aware of? Maybe because his uh, adrenaline was a little high. Maybe just have him do like a self check. Make sure he's okay. Hello. Brian, are you okay? They see blood on the back bumper of the vehicle. Really? Yeah. Did you get hurt? No. Are you sure you don't have any injuries? No, I'm fine. There's blood on it? What? We're not sure. We're it, not it's, sure. It's, it's a red, something red it, underneath the license plate. Similar blood stain. Oh, no. All right. But you're not injured. You don't have any cuts? No, I don't know what would cause blood or whatever it is on the bumper. But you're not injured? No, I'm not injured. Officers may have some concerns about the mysterious red substance on the bumper, but they released the car into the Cohees custody. However, on March 1st, the next day, the police once again find themselves at the Blue Heron boat ramp. A homeless man by the name of Warren Barnes has been reported missing. Officers speak to the woman who called in the report. How do you know Warren? Um, I own Monique's Bridal downtown, and I give him a chair to sit and read his books. Um, when was the last time you saw him? Saturday, 5 o'clock. I said, I'll see you tomorrow, Warren, and he was like, okay, meaning he planned on coming down on Sunday, and then he did not show up. So I'm thinking if they saw him Saturday, maybe it happened more up there because it's weird. He would never come down here. He would never come all the so way down here. he doesn't so have a camp down here or anything? No. He worked for People Ready. And someone found the wallet and called People Ready this morning. And they said that everything looked like it was in there because he doesn't have much. And I just gave him $20 for beer. So I know that he had maybe oh, a couple okay. bucks. So they found his wallet just down here at the boat yep. ramp. Monique Lenati has forged a special friendship with Warren over the years. So why did you, what a raised concern with you today to report him missing? Because the place people already called to see if I had seen him because he didn't show up for work and he's never once not shown up for work in the four years he's been working for them. So I said no and that I hadn't seen him since well, Saturday. He's camping down here. No. no, she's never seen or heard of him being down here. Mm -mm. Never that's why, that's why I'm freaked out because there's no way he walked all the way down here in his wallet. Just so here. in how many years? Did Four he years. Him? Yeah, that's as long as I've known him. Officers soon find that Monique is not alone in her concerns about the missing Warren Barnes. He literally shows up every morning, every day without fail, like at six o'clock, sometimes a little sooner. And we always let him in before the customers. We give him free coffee. He's the nicest old man ever. Do you talk to him at all? All the time. Hey, so good. every morning it's around six. Yeah. Without like, fail. Yeah. Without fail. And he's the nicest guy ever. Rough looking, but he is the nicest guy. Monique gives officers a photograph of Warren in the hopes that it'll help with their search. So that's the only picture you have of him? That's the only one I have, and that's from June of 2019, so he's a little bit thinner. Okay. So who found his wallet out there? Um, the lady from the place said that it was whoever runs the life jacket thingy. Mm -hmm. I'm, the, not, I'm actually the owner of the, of the, the life jacket program on the, on the boat ramp here. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. I hope you guys find him. Oh, I hope yeah. he's okay. If anything, I just hope you find him so that we can start the next process, whatever, because I don't, I don't know. I just have a really bad feeling. Monique's tone doesn't convey much hope. And with only an old photograph, police have very little to go on. However, things are transpiring across town. As it turns out, it was indeed Brian Cohe's father who called about the wallet. He found it in the most unlikely place, the now-recovered Ford 500 that his son accidentally sank in the river. With her suspicions raised, Brian's mother goes into his bedroom to investigate. It's March 1st, 2021, the day after the car incident at the boat ramp, and Terry Cohey is about to make a horrifying discovery as she opens her son's closet. I think it's a human head. It's a what? I think it's a human head. Why do you think it's that? Because it looks like it's a sawn ear. Shocked and terrified by what she's found in her son's closet, Terry Cohey nonetheless has the presence of mind to keep Brian in the dark while she gets police to her address. <laughs> Deputies from the Mesa County Sheriff's Office arrive at Brian's address, wisely leaving their sirens off as they approach. This could have frightened the young suspect, and it's important to keep him calm for the initial interaction. What's going on, man? The deputy makes contact with Brian using a friendly, disarming greeting, 
which goes further to establish an atmosphere of calm. Of course, at the same time, the deputy is certainly scanning the area for any potential threats, as well as making sure that Brian has his hands where he can see them. How much? Cooperate. I am going to cooperate. Okay, so parents have some concerns of some stuff they may have found in your room? Um, yeah, I believe so. And what would it be? A human head and hands. Do you have anything on you he's going to cut, poke, hurt, stick me anything without reaching for nothing? Don't reach for nothing. My phone and my oh. wallet. That's okay. it. Well, I'm going to have you face that way. Put your hands on top of your head for me real quick. I just want to make sure you interlace your fingers for me real quick, all right? It's important that the deputy only ask enough questions to figure out exactly what is going on at the scene. And while this is not the kind of encounter that even a veteran police officer would be accustomed to, it's Brian's parents who must slowly absorb the shock of their son's admission. I'm going to have you walk over here. You're going to sit in the back of my partner's patrol car for a minute, okay? Not yet. Okay. Just sit back there and hang out for me, okay? Can you walk me inside, let's, let's please? Let's walk you off through this, what happened in the beginning. Okay. <laughs> let me do it. You go inside. You well, let's, let's stay out here with let's me for a minute. Let's sit down. Come on, sit down, baby. Can, can I go in there and verify here oh, first? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, we haven't seen that. it. Yeah, we okay. haven't looked at it. It's out of the towel in the sink. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I... <laughs> Annie, stay with your mother. Give her a... Uh, hey, just make sure that guy goes in the car first. I'll be staying there. You can go in the same okay. place. Uh, well, yeah, the okay. Right there. No, yeah. you can have yeah. House is empty. Okay. We had a bag feeling about what happened this weekend. Okay. And she said there's a bag in this closet, and okay. she opened it up. And she called me and said, get over here right now. The deputy correctly asks for permission to enter the house so that he can confirm the grim contents of the kitchen sink. I covered it with the towel. Okay. But I didn't want him to see it because we didn't want him to run. I don't want to look at it. Yep. Just sit back there and hang out with me, okay? How are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? You said your name is Brian? Yeah. Uh, right, Brian. I'm not feeling too well. You're not feeling too well? All right. No, these past few days I've been very, very anxious. That's understandable. So what we're going to have you do here is I'm just going to have you sit in the back here, okay? okay. I'm going to turn on the air for you in a second. You. That way you're not too hot. Are you a hot-blooded or cold-blooded kind of guy? I am very cold-blooded. I prefer cold. Well, no, actually, sorry. Hot-blooded. Hot so you prefer the cold. Okay, fantastic. Thank All you. right. So hop in here. I know you're tall, so it's a little bit of a tight squeeze, but like I said, I'll get that air on for you. Sorry about that. All right. Our induction's been quite violent lately. The officer has no response to this observation. How are you holding up, Brian? Okay. A bit thirsty? You guys have any water in your home? I can't make any guarantees we're going to be able to go in and get some, but I will get some water to you as soon as I can, okay? All right, Brian. We're headed to the sheriff's office and your family's going to go with us, okay? She also doesn't respond on the way to the sheriff's office when Brian casually makes another chilling remark. It's under this bridge. Okay, Brian. Thank you. No problem, sir. So walk with me. We're gonna walk right this way, okay? You're fine with me not being in cuffs. I'm fine with you not being in cuffs. Okay, thank you. All right, Brian, open this door for me, please. Just walk forward for me, Brian. Oh, I should have a mask. You're okay. Don't worry about it, okay? Keep on walking. Keep going. Take another left. Hard left. Right here. Right here. All right. So have a seat, and we'll be with you in a moment, okay? Thanks, Brian. With Brian situated in the interrogation room, investigators speak with his parents to find out what happened that harrowing morning. I'm right here. <laughs> Just take your time. You get as much time as you need, okay? So I know very little about what's going on today. So, um, what started all of what's going on? Terry relays the incident at the boat ramp. <sighs> so we have the car towed back to the address. And, of course, with the battery being wet, you know, nothing was operating. And so my husband was cleaning out the car because he was going to take it into Scotty's to see if they could maybe salvage it. Okay. And um, he found the wallet. So he called me this 
morning and he said, Sell the wallet, Brian's car. Oh, and the officer talked to him there was blood on his car. Okay. The night the that it was in the river. Uh-huh. Okay. The scene and uh, you know, he had just had a procedure done on his armpit a few days before, so I thought maybe the adrenaline opened that back up and that's where it came from. I don't know. And he said, I don't know where it came from and he took special effects class last summer, which involves fake blood. Okay. And he's like, you know, one of those fake blood containers first in my trunk is probably that. And I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. However, his father, Brian Cohe Sr., found something even grislier in the car's glove box and decided to confront his son. Went back out there this morning just to continue, and I opened the glove box, and there was a knife in the glove box, underwater. The glove box is full of water. Very large knife. And then... As I go around the passenger door, I open the passenger door, and there's a wallet in between this door and I open up. That's not Brian's wallet. It's frozen solid. Let me try this. That's not Brian's wallet. So I take him inside. I end up getting one of the wads of cards out. There's a label ready. I read that. So I call it label ready. Mm-hmm. And then another one, another one, there was a social security card. I was like, hey, this is a weird call, but I've got a wallet here with so-and-so's name, and I'm, I'm hoping he works for you all, or he's an he, 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 he subbed him out or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, my boy, we've been missing him. Yes, he didn't show up today. I'm like, oh, my God, now we've got a missing person. Okay, well, I found his wallet at Blue Heaven Boat Ramp. So here's my name. Here's all my information. If you get a hold of him, tell him I've got his wallet here at my house. Okay, so I left that like that. Called Brian. Brian, what's going on? Why is there a wallet in the car? Oh, I found it down at the boat ramp when I was down there walking around. Okay. And, and he was so sincere. I, I, I took it all. I want to believe him. He's my son. Sure. We found out what Brian happened and all this going on in the last two days. Well, how come you didn't tell us about the wallet? My dad, I was just so excited with all the going on. My car getting towed. Look at this wet now. We'll start the, I, I didn't think about it. I didn't think it was important, Dad. I'm like, Brian, who is Warren? Who is this Warren whatever guy? Mm-hmm. Dad, I swear to you, from the bottom, I only know one Warren. He's my school friend. It's not him. I, I, I believe him. Blood on the back on the bumper, right? And I'm like, like a smear of blood, and right. I'm like, that didn't come from that cup. And I asked him, "Ten, why? Right, tell me the truth." Right. I, I knew, but I didn't want to believe it. Was something was going on. Had that gut feeling. Despite the red flags, the family put the strange accident at the boat ramp behind them. But no one was prepared for the spine-chilling discovery Terry made the next morning. I was in his room, cleaning up, putting some things away, and he has a Rubbermaid container in his closet. And so I just kind of started digging through, going, you know, what's, what is this mess? You know, like moms do. And I saw a plastic bag, a white plastic trash bag. And I was like, what in the world does he have in here? And I picked it up, and it was heavy. And I held it in my hands, and I was like, what in the world is this? What in the world? Is it not like maggots covering something? Or I don't know. I've got to take it in the sink. So I carried it out to the sink, and it was double bags. So I ripped open one bag, and I saw an old board. Okay. And I went, I opened the second bag. This one is it. So I didn't open the second bag. Okay. I called my husband. I guess it's Murray Jr. had already gone over his friend's house. He said, I'm all along over to Kai's house. And I said, okay, but, you know, don't be over there too long. He goes, yeah, I should only be over there maybe three or four hours. Let's go hang out with her. And I said, okay. This friend was Kylan like and police would speak with her shortly. So I uh, called his father. He said, how did you speak in Andy from school? He said, I think it's not at 12 30. 12 30, whatever. I just said, you need to come over here right now. And he said, okay, well, I got Andy with me. And I said, you need to come over here right now. And he said, okay, I'll be there in a few minutes. And he hung up. Kylan Like's mother, Heather Gale, recalled what she saw after Brian ended the call. 
And my only memory of that was the way he peeled out of the driveway. I actually have a picture somewhere on my phone of the marks when he left to go because his brother called him, I guess, and said, I need my car back. We know, of course, that this was a ruse on the part of Brian's parents to get him back to the house after their horrifying discovery. Brian, my husband, was already there by that point, and he put a towel over the house. There was nothing for me to Then we fetched a plan to call Brian and tell him that his brother needed the Mustang for a driving lesson because he's one of the learners. Okay. And just as he pulled up, I called him and said, I mean, and he kind of knew something was up. Dad, you ever feel like the day's going to change? He started saying things. I'm like, yeah, we just seemed really vague. Me and Andy was sitting there, and Mom was on the phone, and they were talking to nine one. And it just seemed like it took forever. As his parents continued to speak with the detectives, investigators Pete Berg and Lisa Norcross joined Brian in his room. Over the next two hours, they will hear a shocking story of blood-curdling evil. And before the interview is over, they will even learn the dreadful truth about Brian's ill-fated trip to the boat ramp. Oh, thank you. Hi. Well, this is Lisa. Hi. How are you? Okay. Yeah. Good, thanks. Never really good. Okay. Are you seats? Uh, sure. Ooh, there's a special chair in. <laughs> <laughs> no, this yeah, is the special it. chair because it's soft and I'm old. <laughs> Brian is as cooperative and pleasant with the investigators as he was with the deputy who escorted him to the sheriff's office, but his nervous shaking and insatiable thirst indicate he is perhaps not as calm as he's trying to appear. The question is whether he's anxious about his fate or excited about his moment in the spotlight. One thing to keep in mind is that, according to his mother, Brian is diagnosed with ADHD and autism and leg shaking can be a normal, stimulating behavior for people with these diagnoses. They read Brian his Miranda rights, and he agrees to speak with the officers. Brian, from here? Yeah. Don't worry, you go to school? I've uh, went to Broadway Elementary School just across from my dad's house. Then I went to Brooklyn Middle School. Right. Graduated last year. Good for you. Okay. You. Do you work? Yeah. Where do you work at? Not even part time. I was going to say part time, not even. As a bagger slash courtesy clerk for Safeway, I work anywhere from two to four days a week. It may seem at first glance that the detectives are engaging in idle chit chat to set Brian at ease, but this is part of rapport building. And it's also crucial for them to establish early on that Brian has been handling responsibilities such as school and work and is perfectly capable of carrying on a normal conversation. This will make it much harder for Brian to claim before a jury that he was unable to tell right from wrong. How did you get here? I murdered someone. Okay. It seems that Investigator Berg was merely asking how Brian physically arrived at the sheriff's office. But Brian doesn't stand on ceremony. With a tone and head tilt that suggests he's bragging, Brian makes the ultimate confession. In fact, he's all too willing to discuss this horrific crime with detectives. To start back to the beginning and go slow and tell me as many details as you can remember. So, because I mean, Murray going to jail for the 15 years probably? I have no idea. Because we're at the beginning. It's, <laughs> it's murder. I mean, I'm going to jail for okay. 20 probably, but um, so I figured, well, I fight it. Okay. Um, so what's important to me is to learn as much about you and what you did and, as I can. Well, as many details as you can give me, the better. Brian's polite exterior only adds to the surreal depravity of his confession. He's somewhat of a unique suspect. Let's see. Yeah, it was the night of February 27th. It was a full moon. And I figured, I can see so well, why not try it out? I am in a bad state of mind at that time. I have major depressive disorder, so I am not thinking, shall say, positively. Okay. And I am cruising around for an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so I fill up on gas halfway through, and I'm eventually driving underneath the bridge near the sheriff's office. I'm bad with I'm bad with words. I'm just yeah. by the way, I'm a habitual shaker. I have a question. 
Mm -hmm. You send people who have committed crimes like me. Do we stay in this county jail or are we moved? It all depends on what the judge says. Brian maintains his spirit of cooperation, but he's clearly concerned about what happens after this interview is over. It's interesting to note how he compares himself to others with the phrase, people who have committed crimes like me, almost as if he has joined an exclusive club. So we were at the bridge. Uh, yes, I was at the bridge. I was cruising. So, yeah, I was, there was a road underneath, right? Uh -huh. uh, under the overpass. And I was driving along, and I see a shape here on the railway tracks. So I'm like, oh, interesting. So I go up, and as I'm looking, I see a large thing wrapped in a canvas. Okay. And I'm like, that's a homeless person. So I grab my knife, I put on three layers of gloves because plastic gloves can be trailer users because they're so thin, the final gloves, mm -hmm. by printing your fingerprints through. So I put on two, three on one hand. I took the knife, I pulled back the canvas, and I stabbed his neck. Okay. He was panicking at first in his old man voice. He was in his 50s. I don't know why I, know why I call him an old man. He was saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why? Ah. And I just kept on stabbing his neck. I was, is this okay if I do a demonstration? Oh, yeah. This is him. I was straddled on top of him like this. Okay. And uh, he couldn't fight back. It was actually surprisingly easy. I was barely breaking the sweat. I thought, oh, this guy, he's going to be tough. But no, it was actually surprisingly easy. And during the time I was growling and making animalistic noises. At this point, there can be no doubt that Brian is excited to tell the investigators all about his horrific deed. Not only is he pleased to be holding court, he's actually reliving the murder and relishing the memory, demonstrated by a smile. As for any question of this crime being premeditated, Brian admits to having put on three layers of gloves, which he already had with him. The whole ordeal lasted about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. And when I was finished stabbing him, he took out his last breath, a grunt, and his head was halfway cut off in stabs. All the while, no, actually, after I killed him, I just couldn't stop saying stinky, dirty, dirty, stinky, stinky. It wasn't, I wasn't smelling anything, but... In an eerie coincidence, on one of his social media accounts, Brian identifies himself as that stinky boy registered under his email ID. Can why were you saying that? I don't know. Okay. But you remember doing it, so. Yeah. I suppose it was just me speaking out my mind at that moment. It was like pouring out of the mind. Were you worried about, I mean, this looks like it's pretty close to the road and stuff. Somebody seen you well, or catching you? It was 11 p.m. Okay. So not many were driving by. Well, it was behind the pillar. So like, here's the road. Uh -huh. It was here. So people would only see a brief thing here and here. So were you worried about them seeing you? I was worried about one of them stopping. What did you think would happen if somebody... Well, if they looked, well, it was quite dark under there, so they wouldn't have seen the guy unless okay. they looked. Um, they would have seen me holding a bloody 12-inch knife, okay. wearing gloves, and wearing a mask to conceal my identity, a face mask. Okay. So you weren't doing it for COVID, you were doing it for hide your face? Um, partially. Social distancing. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, but no one stopped, and I'm just like, huh, proves the bystander effect. His laughter and offhand comments speak to his mindset, which is that nothing is wrong. Brian mentions the bystander effect here, which is the idea that the more people there are watching a crime, the less likely that anyone will stand up and do anything about it. There are a few different reasons behind this, but we know that it often occurs because people may be afraid that they'll be judged by the rest of the crowd if they step in first to do something. Ultimately, people are social creatures, and the vast majority of people chose to do whatever the rest of the crowd does. It's a rare person that steps forward alone. I noticed you got a cut on your hand. Is that from... Oh, that was when I was doing gas, when I filled up. What happened was, because I don't want to be seen in a gas station with a knife poking out of my pocket, I put it in the car on the back seat floor. When I'm done with it, 
I try and grab it, but my hand slips and grabs the blade, and as I pick it up, it slices these two fingers. Okay. And then, let's see. Yeah. And then, after that, I strip his clothes. I cut open his belly. You see his guts. They're really pink. <laughs> Sorry, that was morbid. One of the exceptional aspects of Brian's confession is the level of detail he provides. Together with his casual commentary and jokes, these details convey to investigators that Brian is being fully truthful about what he did. It's also worth noting that morbid humor has long been one of Brian's trademarks. What about other kids in the neighborhood or on the bus? He didn't really, you know, he had a couple of friends that he's had since, since elementary, but... You know, he had a morbid, he had a morbid sense of humor and would make jokes. And I'd say, Brian, that is not funny. And he'd go, yeah, it is, Mom. You just don't get my sense of humor. In an interview with prosecutors, Kylan Like, who's known Brian since the ninth grade and whose house Brian was visiting just before his arrest, says that being provocative is a hallmark of his personality. Um, when I first met him, he was very edgy is the best way I can describe it. He loved to get a reaction out of people and say things that would make people have a double take. He wanted to go against the flow. His jokes were always in the realm of dark humor. Very rarely did he make jokes that weren't somehow relating to death or violence or destruction or breaking the law or just basically just humor that is considered dark humor. And I, I know a couple of people personally who just hated him because that's kind of how he is. You either think it's hilarious or you hate it. And that's the people who think it was hilarious was a small percentage of people that unfortunately and embarrassingly included myself. And my very best friend of high school, Emily, was someone who hated him. And, you know, she's a bigger girl and he would call her fat and call her pig and call anybody who looked like that things along the same line. Like, just spiteful, I guess. Just trying to, like, like I said, get a rise out of people. Kylan Like is not the only one who noticed Brian's love of sick humor. While in a youth diversion program two years earlier, Brian asked the other teens if they enjoyed a snack known as crispy meat bites. He joked that the recipe involved running your cat or dog through a meat grinder and then frying them up. Despite Brian's predilection for dark humor, Kylan's mom tells investigators that she never worried about her daughter being friends with him. He didn't seem scary to me at the time. He just seemed unusual, like mm -hmm. in the way that my nephew and other people I know that are on the spectrum are just a little unusual, like not a lot of eye contact, you know, things like that. But he never struck me as scary. Like I said, I actually let my daughter and her friends, not that I was in charge of her friends, but I let her sleep over at his house like a month, two months, whatever, New Year's. And his mom, as far as I know, she ran a daycare. So I mm -hmm. thought, you know, good with kids, whatever, you know. Okay. Not only does Brian's mom run a daycare, she runs it out of her home. Upon discovering the severed head in her son's closet that afternoon, she had to scramble to get parents to pick up their children before calling police. And I sent home all the children. I had a few little kids over, but I was watching. So I called their parents and they said, this is a family emergency. Please come pick up your children right away. They're safe. They're not hurt. I was so scared. Everything's okay. Took their kids home. Back in the interrogation room, Brian goes into further nauseating detail about the post-mortem mutilation of Warren Barnes. Destroyed his eyes by stabbing them. Okay. And then I cut off his hands. I put those in plastic Ziploc bags. And then I cut off his right arm at this joint okay. and at this joint. And then at this arm, I tried cutting it here, and then I tried cutting it here, but what happened was I accidentally broke his bone. This one, it was poking out. And so I left that one here, partially cut, dismembered here, bone sticking out. And then I left his body there. And then I took the head, put it in a leftover pizza box from the dinner a few nights ago. And then I took the hands, put them in the back, drove home, hid the hands and head in my room, cleaned the knife, threw away the garbage with, with the blood on it, and then put the blood stained, it wasn't stained, it had splatters on it. I put it in the dish, in the, um, the washing machine, 
What, what did you put in there? I put the outfit I murdered him in. in the you were in? Or? Yeah, at Iowa was wearing. Okay. In a, in a washing machine, put it on high speed so it would effectively remove the blood. Wash it twice. You'll notice again that not only is Brian's level of detail remarkable and disturbing, he talks about the steps he took to avoid getting caught. These will undoubtedly be important elements to any eventual prosecution as it goes to establishing his state of mind. I can back up just so I don't lose track of where my mind is. So you cut him open, did you cut his arms off, his hands off, all that, before you went home? Yeah, before I went home, I tossed the arm bits around. Like, I took the right arm bit, threw it out, okay. took the left arm bit, threw it out. So it's somewhere around that bridge? Yeah, but look in a... Because I know crime scenes can be a very wide area. Mm-hmm. You're going to want to look in a... Five in a ten foot area. So like this is a zoom in. So here's the road. And here's where my car was parked. You're going his corpse is here. The interview continues to get more and more bizarre. In addition to reliving the mutilation in full pantomime. Brian enthusiastically goes over the dimensions and location of the crime scene, as if he's a police lieutenant giving a briefing to his officers. I hope I'm being cooperative. Oh, you're doing great. So you could have just walked over here? I could have. It's no use trying to deceive Paul. So that's north, and you threw... What all did you throw while you were there? I mean, how many pieces am I looking for? There are two pieces of arm... This section and this section, just in this general area. I can't, I couldn't say where they are. Armed with information they've been fed from the interrogation, police officers descend on the area. There they find a scene that will no doubt haunt them for the rest of their lives. It's right here. Can you see it? Yeah. Because there's an arm. Hey. (laughs) The female cop starts to laugh when she sees an arm. It's unfortunate that the family and the court will hear this. There's an arm, there's another arm. There's another one. I don't have a clue. This is like something out of TV. Yeah. Just have to have a discussion with the deputy chief about how people, how these kids don't have any. uh... All right, here's a leg. It could be the upper arm or a leg. Well, there's three. There, there, and there. Pieces down there. I mean, if we can get the lab out here, that would be the best thing. Good forensics. Holy hell. As police officers less than half a mile away take measure of the bleak crime scene under the bridge, Detective Norcross probes more deeply into the whereabouts of the rest of Warren Barnes' remains. You took, was it the head and the hands? Mm-hmm. Um, and when did you put that in? Well, there's a three rule for bodies. I like to call it the three rule. Okay, tell me about that. Three days the body starts to stink. No, three hours, rigor mortis sets in, the body stiffens. Three days the body starts to stink because of deep composition. Mm-hmm. Three weeks, the body is starting to seriously decompose. Right, right. Three months, the body is unrecognizable. Three years, it turns into a skeleton. And may I ask how you know that? I just, I've always had a fascination with forensics and with anatomy and physiology. That's something I made up. So that's something I, I don't want to sound like I'm inventing something. But that's, what, that's why I coined the three of the wall. You kind of remember it that way. Yeah. That's your way of remembering it. Is it accurate? Well, so what? So what? So. This segment is fascinating for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the remarkable display of skill on the part of Detective Norcross, who makes Brian feel as though she's mesmerized by his account of the three rule. She gives him a moment of validation at the end, and Brian's satisfaction is obvious. His ego is stroked, and he feels that he's earned the approval of the detectives. Yeah, so what did you, you have the head and the hand at yeah. your house. The head, I put, because it was starting to stink, I was planning on throwing the head and hands away. On the trash bag, not in the kitchen trash, 
but they were both in trash bags. The head was in a trash bag, I tied up the trash bag. Hands, I put in a trash bag as well. They were in Ziploc bags. And I was go. I was planning, do they sell empty paint buckets? Mm -hmm. I was planning to buy an empty paint bucket, put the head in it, seal it, and then I was going to throw it off in some ditch. Okay. With the hands I would throw in a different spot, wherever. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I have it right. The head is inside of a trash bag. It was. Well, where is it now? In the kitchen sink. My parents searched through my room and they found the head and hands. Okay, and so are the head and the hands in the kitchen sink now? Last time I checked. Okay, so they're in the kitchen sink now because your parents put them there. But they were in my closet. As of now, investigators have only found a head, hands, and several pieces of arm. That leaves the mystery of where the rest of Warren Barnes is. What exact kind of trash bag? White. White, like a kitchen one, or what, like a kitchen, kitchen one. Okay. White kitchen. One that you put in a trash can. Yeah. And then what about the hands? They were inside Ziplocs, you said. Both in the, it's in the same, both in a different trash bag. Okay, the white kitchen trash bag. Yes. But now they're in the kitchen sink. Yes. And you talked about cutting the, uh, I used to be a paint cutter. I know it's not easy just to cut off hands. Oh, right? yeah. It was it was with the knife. I was just. So did you practice on anything else? No. How did you know how to do it? Um, no, I I just went along as a process. The bones, I just pressed the blade down and went, okay. except for them at the ligaments. Okay. And how hard was it to do that? To get them actually? Not the particularly hard. hard. I was just more frustrated that I broke Okay. So if you hadn't got frustrated, what would your, I mean, it sounds like what you did, we know. Did you have a different plan? Um, Why were you the original? Because I always wanted to know what it felt like to cut up someone. Okay. So the arms just. So why did you stop? Why did you stop? Because the arms were just, that's it. And that's all I wanted to know was, was like cutting off a limb. And I'm just like, okay. Okay. Again, the mind reels when confronted with the nonchalant attitude Brian has toward discussing the murder and dismemberment of a human being. And um, you said you studied criminology and forensics and all that? I do not, not college study or school study. It's like a packing interest. I understand. But what, were you worried about, like, leaving evidence behind? Or oh, caught? Totally. So tell me about that and what you did then. Well, I was figuring the police don't, this is not to be taken offense, but police, they don't seem to care as much about high-risk individuals, homeless people, prostitutes, etc. So I was deliberately looking for someone who lived that type of life. Okay. And I found a homeless person. And the original goal was just leave him there. But I was worried about the fibers on the outfit I was wearing that would be on his his uh, clothes and stuff. So I deliberately messed up the clothes. This is an outstanding amount of premeditation for a youth offender. It's a shocking amount for anyone, but particularly because of his age, his executive functioning is years from being developed, and yet he's thought so much of this through. It's chilling to think what he may have been capable of had he not been caught. Brian remains engaged, casual, and even jovial as he describes his mindset on the night of the murder. His detailed concerns about getting caught will make it very difficult for his lawyers to mount an effective insanity defense. According to Kylan Like's mother, Heather Gale, this isn't the first time that Brian talked about choosing a victim on the outskirts of society. Anything else, you've, even things you've heard from Kylan come to mind? She told me that he had mentioned that he would, that he was going to kill a homeless person because nobody would miss them and he could get away with it. Yet once in an interview, Kylan tells a different story. He never talked to me about wanting to kill a homeless person specifically, but he definitely talked to me a lot about, like, killing. And I was actually surprised because I figured that if he was going to do something like this, that it would be on a larger scale. Like, I thought he would, I don't want to sound vulgar, but I figured if he was going to snap, it would be like shooting up a store or something similar like that. And he had mentioned, like, not liking his neighbors, so I thought maybe something would happen there. So I was actually really, I was surprised that he had killed someone, but I was also surprised that it had only been one person. So how long have you been planning or looking for someone to do this with before you found this guy? About a year. About a year? No, six months. 
Brian's internet search history adds an interesting element to this as he looked up homicidal thoughts every day and how to cope with murderous thoughts. So you come close or seen somebody or chickened out or anything in the past? No. I mean, I was looking for a deliberately secluded place like that one. I wouldn't just go up in Clifton and find someone walking down the street and stab them. No, that's, that's too public. Everyone sees that. Well, have you looked like at the homeless places or anything in the past? I have, yes. I would go on night drives often, maybe once every two weeks. Now just peruse the streets. So before this guy, how close have you come in the past? Not at all. Not at all? You just drive around? And yeah, look, just try and find Is anybody interesting? And no. In your mind thought of a plan? Well, occasionally when you see girls walking down the street, uh, I take a glance at them. Because um, okay. it really is like Ed Kemper where half of me says, well, I'm, I'm quite inept with women. <laughs> I'm being honest, I'm no Casanova. But half of me says, I want to take that girl home and make her feel nice. And the other half of me, it's just like what Ed said, is I want to see what her head looks like on a stick. Brian is describing a mindset that's detestable, yet he delivers it with a smile and a laugh. His obvious excitement in describing both his mindset and the murder raises questions about his psychological history. As well, another internet search Brian made reveals that he may have considered other sickening plans as well, as he searched for how do people react to a home invasion. However grisly Brian's sense of humor might seem, it's again worth noting that it's a trait his friends are familiar with. One of Brian's friends, Patrick Rahor, spoke with police. Our, our whole friend group was like really weird. We were like all of those. We're just a group of people like don't really fit anywhere else and they end up like finding each other at different points throughout school. We were just all kind of weird together. And so like the off filler stuff and like anything that like seemed weird, I just kind of like took for Brian being Brian and just kind of tried to accept it. However, even his friend must admit that Brian was different. Our friend group would joke about if there was one of us that would, like, be a killer, it would be him. But it was, like, meant as a joke and only as a joke. I don't think any of us actually thought that something like that would or could happen. If his friends thought this, was there a chance that his parents did, too? Tell me about Brian. Does he have any kind of mental um, issues or disabilities? Why? We were told he has ADHD. Okay, so we put him on ADHD medicine. He didn't get it during the summer or weekends when he went to middle school. He started exhibiting antisocial behavior, just saying things to get kids riled up and thinking it was funny. And then when he switched to Fruita High School, he did okay in ninth grade, tenth grade, he got in a lot of trouble, a lot of behavior issues. Eleventh grade, we had a big meeting and they said, so we put him in R5. We took him and did some, some testing for ADHD and went on through division of rehab. And the doctor had said, yes, he's ADHD. Yes, he's autistic. Yes, he's this. Oh, and there's some indications that, that he should get further testing because of potential psychosis. And I asked about referrals and calls and nobody in town to see him. Okay, well, he seems to be doing good. You know, he graduated high school. He works at Safeway. And he's been working there for a year in August. And he's there part-time. And he said he's not taking his medication. Or is he on medications now? He's on ADHD medicine. Okay. That he takes before work on his part-time job. And he takes... Um, sertraline, which is an anti-anxiety, anti-depressant. Okay, so he's been diagnosed. And to the best of your knowledge, is he actually taking them? Like, do you watch him take them? I don't or? watch him take them, but I have an alarm set, and every 9 at 10 p.m., I say, Brian, take your medicine. And he says, I know, I am. Okay. And as I've looked at his pill container, I mean, it's going, you know, seems to be, seems to be going down. Okay. So I assume he was taking about, I'm thinking, three years ago? I'm guessing. I don't know. 
because he had him going to counseling. He was going to counseling, and he just thought about it. He just, it just came across his head. It was just, but then I think everybody thinks about it, but I just well, I remember one of the times when he was really lonely, and that was an issue. You know, we were kind of concerned about that. He made jokes about making deuces or doing that and doing that. Okay. But I don't know. I just played it off as normal talk, but I'm like, you know, Brian, we wouldn't, you know, I, I didn't know the depth of the water. I don't, I don't understand. He's obviously sick. He's obviously very sick because we've noticed weird things about him. So he gets cold. Just, just he looks at me and he has this cold look on his face. Just like he's been so far, Brian makes no qualms about admitting his battles with mental health. You say you have a major depressive disorder. I'm just curious what those are. Well, actually, I have several. I have high functioning Asperger's. I have ADHD mm-hmm. and major depressive disorder. Okay. Major depressive, so you were wondering what that last one is? Yeah, I know what they are. I was curious, yeah, if you, what the exact diagnosis was and, and who diagnosed them. They tested me for autism for a formal diagnosis, okay. like Asperger's, uh-huh. which is high functioning autism. Yep. And they also said that I was schizo something. That isn't me misremembering. They just said you have, you're schizo something, whether that be schizophrenia schizoaffective, schizotypal, or schizoid disorder. They said I was, I had something that was schizo. The detectives are once again trying to delve into Brian's psychology, attempting to prove that he knew right from wrong at the time of the murder. His search history adds another layer to his story as he looked up extreme paranoia, schizoid and paranoid personality disorder, and avoidant personality. I was never formally diagnosed with anything like that. Do you feel like you have that? I don't know. Possible as hell. Self-diagnosing is foolish. Yeah. But do you, you know, schizophrenia is pretty clear because people recognize they have a different personality in them. I don't have any hallucinations. Okay. I have, I had, have delusions, I guess. Okay. Like, years ago, I thought I was obsessed with people staring at me. Okay. Like I felt people watching me from every window. The birds were looking at me, watching me. Okay. For greater purpose. That was a delusion, I suppose. Okay. Right. But you don't have times where you feel like another personality is in your body. Like, no, that. You remember all this. That's, no, that's that's dissociative identity disorder. Right. Schizophrenia is. Well, you you have multiple people talking to you at the same time, kind of a thing. Um. There's a very good reason they're asking these questions. Because Brian said he has some kind of schizo diagnosis, they're trying to determine if he committed the crime under some kind of command hallucination, which may mean he could be deemed not guilty by reason of insanity. However, Brian denies having voices in his head. As well, his search history goes far in showing exactly what he was thinking about in the lead up to the murder. One day before and again on the day of the murder, Brian pulled up Wikipedia articles for several notorious killers, including James Dale Ritchie, Joseph Christopher, and Andrea Yates. In the month leading up to the murder, he also looked up topics such as how do people react to being held at knife point, how deadly is a neck stab wound, and he read an article about the killing of a homeless man in Baton Rouge. What do you think would happen if you got caught? Well, I figured my mother would have confronted me about it, but no, she was, she didn't even say it. Do you know who the person was that you killed? Uh, no. I took his wallet. I didn't look at it. I just picked it up, briefly scanned over it, and put it in my car. Apparently, it was worn. My mom told me this before she found out that the missing person was Warren Brown, born in 63. Brian doesn't seem particularly interested in knowing more about his victim, and the detectives turn Brian back to the subject of the evidence. So we talked about the stuff there we're going to go look for. Mom's off in the sink, apparently. Uh, yeah. The knife is where? My dad found it in the gun box. I don't know where it is. What did the knife look like that you found in the... You know when you buy like a 10-piece knife set, mm-hmm. the biggest one in there? I think when, when we moved to day, to Terry into the daycare, we probably bought all new kitchens, and I think he just took it out of the kitchen because we found it in his car before. Brian, you don't need this. That I do. I don't trust anybody. Okay. You don't find any blood or anything on it. I cleaned it. All of his prolongings except for his wallet are right here. And his head and his hands. 
his head and his hands are at the house. Any hey, reason you were wearing dark blue, blue one piece jumpers? You know the movie Halloween, Michael Myers? Mm -hmm. He wears one of those, and for Halloween last year, I bought that as a costume to find the mask in my room. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I just associated that piece of, that article of clothing with uh, violence. That's why I was wearing it that night. Yes. As horrifying as all of this is, nothing they've heard so far can prepare investigators for the rest of the seismic revelations to come. First, however, detectives have a simple question for the killer sitting before them. Have you ever done it before? No. Okay. You gotta ask, right? Yeah. How about animals? Have you practiced on anything? Yes. It's pretty big stuff. Tell me about that. This was 2018 Halloween. A stray black cat had been coming around our house. This was before I moved into my mom's. This was at my dad's. And I was thinking about killing him. The video is redacted in this part, but the transcript from the sheriff's office says that Brian told detectives that he herded the cat into a sleeping bag and beat it, strangled it, and snapped its neck. He then decapitated the cat, hid the body in a shoebox, and hid the head in a wine cork box. It seems clear that Brian has a sick interest in decapitation. There are chilling parallels between what he did to the cat and to Warren, including decapitation and keeping the heads in boxes. Both times he preyed on those he knew were vulnerable and that he believed no one would notice. And then I disposed them in the trash and got away with it. Okay. And that cat. Did you keep them for a while, like you did this guy, or? I kept it for three days, then it started to stink. So you got the three days and it stinks? Cool. Also because bacteria starts to float the body after a day to three days, so. The story that Brian might have killed a cat is actually a widespread rumor in Grand Junction. Um, did you ever hear about Brian, either from him or anybody else, about him killing a cat? Yes, I remember hearing about it, but it honestly just sounded like made-up rumor, so I didn't really like think anything about it. Did you ever talk to him directly about it? Like, ask him if it was I true? I did. I don't really remember. Do you ever remember him saying, yes, I did that, or no, I didn't, anything like that? Okay. But you had heard rumors that possibly it happened, but never really got to the bottom of it? Patrick is not the only one to hear rumors of this type and ignore them, saying it was some kind of a sick joke. I know that there was another girl in that class who told me that she lived near him in that neighborhood and that they were always missing cats and she felt like he was stealing cats in the neighborhood. And honestly, I don't remember if I found that out through him or through friends, mm -hmm. but yeah, I definitely know about the cat. Did you believe that or did you think it was just Brian saying something outrageous? Honestly, I don't know. I think I believed it, but that I didn't want to because I am a big animal lover mm -hmm. and that's just, I didn't want to see my friend in that kind of light. I remember my friends just talking about how messed up it was and my friend Sean said that he knew the person whose cat it was and he was super upset because the cat was like super friendly or whatever. But I don't think I ever heard it around Brian himself. In a redacted portion of the interrogation video, Brian admits to finding a dead groundhog by the side of the road, which he skinned and attempted to make leather out of approximately a year before the murder. It sounds like you killed a cat. No. Well, actually, I was thinking of killing people during the cat, but I wasn't acting on it. Um, but I started seriously thinking about killing people a year ago. How about when you were 12? Did you think about killing people? No. So what in your life has changed or what in your mind has changed? To make I you, don't know. Was it like something all of a sudden one day you woke up and thought, I'll kill someone, or was it a gradual? It was gradual, I think. So tell me about when those thoughts were still happening. Well, in high school. The interrogation is again redacted here, but Brian says, quote, Call me weird, but I think everyone has had thoughts of shooting up their school. I suppose I just don't really like people. Um, but he wanted to read really bizarre things and things that we didn't have in the library. Um, I remember he actually checked out a book about Son of Sam, and then the next quarter he wanted to read about the Columbine shootings. He was very obsessed with just that kind of darker stuff. You mentioned a writing assignment, and I can't remember anything specific just because it's been so long, but it, it does seem like there was at some point something he wrote, an idea about Columbine or something like that, and I can't remember really the specifics. Okay. It's more of a sense that he had an unhealthy fascination with school shootings. Back in the interrogation, Brian tells the detectives that this isn't the first time his family has found something unsettling in his room. 
Last year, my parents found a kit I had been assembling. It had hammers, shovels, knives, forks, and ties, duct tape, a uh, saw. That was meant for hurting people. They found it though, and I had convinced them it was for other methods, for other things. And it was an ultimatum where if I didn't throw it away, all that, they would call the police. And then I would have been arrested on charges of conspiracy. That was last year, before Halloween. So what made you put that kit together? That was for nights like that. So back then you were thinking about doing that? Too. Yes. So that was $100 stone, right? In an interview, Brian's high school teacher recalls that his parents didn't seem overly interested in his disturbing behavior. We weren't obviously the only class that was having issues with him, and I remember said that they had met with mom, and she kind of, I think they said, like, didn't really understand, like, what kind of, like, what's the big deal sort of thing. Like, she wasn't really like, yeah, this is serious, or we need to get ahead of it. It sounded like they didn't get anywhere with her, from what I remember. Indeed, a friend of Brian's mom notes that Terry felt that school authorities were unfairly singling out her son. Terry had like a binder, I remember, of information that she had mm-hmm. conflicts with with District 51. Okay. Um, I know growing up as a kid, he was really teased in school that they would call him like four eyes, geek, loser, dork, all that stuff. But the detectives in the interrogation room are more interested about his murderous intentions in the preceding months. I'm really curious when you talked about the hammer and the shovels and the knives and like the zip ties. I mean, what was kind of your plan then? That's a little bit different than you did this time. Oh, yeah. So what was the plan back then? The plan was to go find, because there's no prostitutes in Grand Junction, I don't think. Have you ever had any sex crimes? Yeah. yeah. There's not prostitutes like five of them standing along the side of the road, but there's prostitutes in Grand Junction. Yeah, the plan was to go with one of them and have them come with me. And then the plan was to subdue them and tie them up and then torture her. So what made you not go back to the same plan and get, you know, if you kind of had that as a plan. Would I have been caught? Well, I don't know. My point is if your your folks, your mom found your stuff, right? Yes. And got rid of it. Why didn't you go back to that plan? Why change plans? Too much risky. Oh. First time in a row, they'll be like, okay, that's really suspicious, but okay, we forgive you, don't do it again. Okay. Second time in a row, we're calling the police on you. Oh. I didn't want to do that again. Okay, fair Too enough. Risk. And so they didn't call the police? Uh, no, because they gave me an ultimatum, have them throw it all away or call the police. So I threw it all away. Detective Norcross does an excellent job showing great interest in Brian's kits and his previous plans all of which encourages the suspect to keep talking and helps build a strong case against him. At this point, the video is redacted, but according to the transcript, the detectives ask Brian if he ever expressed any of his dark thoughts to his parents. He tells them yes, but only disguised as jokes. For instance, he once said, quote, Wouldn't it be funny if you sold a lipstick with mercury on it to those beauty pageant queens and they got poisoned because of their pride? Brian was making these kinds of comments while in high school, as his teacher shares. And then he would just say some bizarre things, like to get a rise out of class, kind of to try and get attention on him, like just say a racial slur, or, you know, just kind of be loud and not just to try and get attention. Were those outbursts, like, pretty random, just in the middle of class? or? Were well, they- like, one was watching a video, I think it's about, like, Genghis Khan or something, so it's not like, you know, an Asian racial slur. I think it was, oh, he got that, or something like that. Okay. Of course, the matter before investigators today isn't Brian's inappropriate humor, but his actions on the night of the murder, and the revelations from that night are far from over. Brian finally reveals the twisted true story behind his mishap with his car and the river two nights ago. What were you doing down here, bud? Well, I felt like I needed to get out, and I figured, why not park here and just just relax a little just bit? relax and think. As it turns out, Brian's road trip to the Blue Heron boat ramp had absolutely nothing to do with relaxation. He explains to the detectives that after he murdered Warren Barnes, he returned home to try and sleep. But I was worried that because there was a hole in my class right here, I was worried that they would be able to obtain a partial print. So I figured, why not go all the way? I drove back in a different outfit, picked up his body, surprisingly heavy put it in my trunk and drove to the Blue Heron drop-off station. I parked, so it's like this, right? So let's say this is ground. The ramp is quite steep, and you need to have four-wheel drive to pull out of it. Okay. And uh, my car didn't. 
<laughs> so I pull in. I thought that I could drive out because so, uh, I put I put it in reverse a so that it's easier to pull the body out and b because the back tires would provide propulsion to push up. Right. And I open the trunk. I take this body out. I put it in the water. And because I don't want fingerprints on a body, so I just try moving it with my shoes. Um, that works for successfully. He goes out some part in the river and floats off. Okay. God knows where he is now. Would it be a he? He's dead. Still a he. Okay, yeah. God knows where he is now. I think my guess was that it would be discovered this morning or next morning. So I'll uh, keep an eye out for any river related activity. Okay. To inevitably drive out. Yeah. My car didn't come out. From Blue Heron. Yeah, from Blue Heron. Yeah. My car was stuck. I tried putting it full throttle. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't work. <laughs> My car doesn't have four wheel drive. Ha ha ha. me. Okay. And so then I tried putting it in low gear. I'm trying everything because that's right. Right. And it still doesn't come out. And then okay. it slides into the river. Oh. My car slides into the river, the inside. And so I'm there in a car quickly being flooded with water. Okay. It is the middle of February. It's cold. At night. Yeah. In the river that's almost freezing. Yes. I'm drenched. <laughs> I almost died. So I'm able to climb out. Um, I don't see the body, so I'm, I assume this is travel a bit. Okay. I come up, and I'm sitting there. I need to act fast or else I'll die of hypothermia. I'm, a, yeah. I'm panicking a bit at this point. I'm going to be like, this is what I'm going to remember for dying of hypothermia and a botched attempt at hiding a body. And I'm just like, once again, we see Brian in good spirits while sharing what could pass as an amusing anecdote if it were not for the horrifying truth behind what he's describing. His story also shows that he has a preoccupation with how he'll be remembered. And what did you tell your parents? I mean, you obviously, you know, got to tell them something the car's in the yeah. So what I say is, I feel like I need to get out. I often do. I feel like I need to get out in my thoughts. Have you ever felt yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So I say that I drive down to the Blue Heron Point and just park and just turn off the car and think. And uh, I tell them that I'm stupid and I park too low and then my car flies in the river. Okay. Did they believe you? Yes. And then the police came. I didn't do a breathalyzer test because when I they, wasn't drinking. When they did the police or the sheriff? Think it was the police. Okay. In addition to the rest of the damning evidence Brian relays to the detectives, he now reveals that he was not intoxicated on the night of the murder, closing off another potential defense in court. However, what immediately caught the police's attention is blood from the body was on the reverse bumper. See, I was so, see, I forgot to wipe it off. And I was so panicked, I wasn't thinking. And so when they pull it out, they immediately see blood on the bumper. And they're all thinking, we'd really like to get in this trunk. Fools. There is nothing in the trunk. Ah. Okay. And that happened this morning? No, they noticed it last. They noticed it after I'd been sent home at 3 a.m. Okay. They noticed the blood. But, yeah, this morning, they noticed more blood on the door handle, the other door handle, passenger one, and also the multi-laid gloves in the car. I took them out and obviously... My car went there before I was able to throw them away. Sure. So did the cops talk to you guys about that this morning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the cops from the police department, did they talk to you about that this morning? No, I was not contacted. Oh. Brian's car was pulled out of the river in the early morning hours of February 28th, and this interrogation takes place the next day. All they were planning to do with me today is get my insurance information. Sure. And they were so curious about the blood. Did they ask you about that? No, because oh. they did not notice it while I was still there. So when you say they were curious about the blood, how do you know that they were curious? Because my parents told me. Oh. They saw the blood too, oh. and they were curious. But I was, I said, I don't know where the blood came from. And they thought okay. maybe it was just cut, but obviously a cut doesn't produce that much blood. And they said maybe it was the recovering abscess under my arm, but that scabbed up. So they didn't know what to believe this day because it's blood, it's sticky, it's sinewy, but I can't name a source. So they were just a tiny bit curious. Yeah. Not tiny bit, they were curious. Yeah. This is another spot of his oddly placed laughter, showing that he really enjoys talking about the sick details. However, his position of superiority didn't last long. 
Police do indeed find more blood in and on the car, confirming Brian's tale. And I was worried about just um, how long it would take to find him because it's a somewhat traveled road where at least have a nose for that type of thing. They're trained to be able to identify the smell of a corpse. And um, obviously that was botched. The true story of what happened at the boat ramp will come as news to his friend Kylan Like, with whom Brian shared a very different account. First, though, on the very same night that he dumped Warren's body into the river, Brian messaged a group on Discord, which Kylan was part of. He wrote, So, uh, I totaled my car. It's in the river. One of his friends replied, What? You okay? Brian wrote back, Yeah, I okay. My car aren't, though. So I said, Hey, are you okay? I don't have Discord RN, but I heard the news. And he said, Yeah, I'm fine. Almost died, lol. Sorry for the late response. My phone was off. I said, it's okay. What happened? He said, I was out driving, needed to clear my thoughts. So I park at the boat ramp, drop off at the river, but my dump parks on the dirt and mud ramp. So when I try and leave, it gets stuck. I don't have my phone on me because it's dead. I try shimmying it, low gearing it, nothing works. Then it slides into the river, me inside. I'm able to get out drenched in cold water, 1 a.m. I responded, oh my God. He said, it's freezing out in February at night. I know I'll die of hypothermia if I don't act fast. So I make my way onto the road and wait for a car that takes five minutes. I flag him down and the Samaritans help me by letting me use their phone to call my parents and to heat up in their car. I said, Jesus Christ, dude. He said, they arrive, the police are called, and we collectively decide to wait until tomorrow to tow it out. So in summary, I nearly died and am out of a car. It was towed out this morning, but I'm fine. Sorry for the wall of text. That was my Saturday night. The Samaritans Brian mentioned are Durwood Piper and his grandson, Kellen, who stopped to help him that night. In an interview, Kellen describes Brian's behavior at the boat ramp. Uh, during the encounter, before his family got there, he uh, kept kind of pacing around and saying, I'm effed, you know, expletive, and uh, tried to calm down a little bit because I thought he was kind of concerned about his family finding out he crashed his car in the river or something. And I was like, hey, it's going to be okay, you know. And it seemed to calm down a little bit, but I just remember it was a little off-putting how he just kept on pacing saying, I'm effed, I'm effed, I'm effed. It's over and over and over again, so. With his attempts to dispose of the body and cover his tracks, Brian is showing clearly that he knows right from wrong. His mindset is further demonstrated by his search history on the day after the murder, when he looked up how to wipe data from Android phone. Does a river wash away evidence? How to dispose of organic refuse? His history also contains numerous searches for information on serial killers, a subject Brian has great interest in. I read books. I have a book on forensics. Okay. Did you read the book, the Ted Bundy book? No, it was on the internet. Yeah, okay. All right. And Pete has studied him, too. Yeah. yeah you know, so... Uh, great. Do you know who I'm... Ted Gain? No, I am in California. Yeah. Ed Kemper. Yeah. So you know? I know of him. He was... He won the... He was won the place. He was a quiet. He was... Six foot nine, three hundred pounds. So can I ask you a question? Almost all those people did this for some sort of whether they had the face of the body or what? it was some sexual gratification in their mind. Criminology, there's different types of I'm not a serial killer by no means. But some serial killers there's different types of them. There's organized, disorganized, visionary, missionary. I'm just wondering what what gets you excited about doing it? Well, I'm not really sexually attracted to it. Okay. I was just asking. Brian's statement that he found no attraction to the concept of murder is doubtful given his excitement at the chance to relive the killing by telling the officers every little detail of the crime. Still, the detectives are determined to figure out the why behind Brian's gruesome actions. So uh, I'm curious about the cutting him up, taking parts of him home, and you were thought about, so it sounds like you've had like Ted Bundy sex type stuff. Ed Kemper just kill people because you want to kill somebody, plus the sex and stuff. Um, how about Jeffrey Dahmer? It wasn't really, it wasn't really inspired by it. It was just more, well, I'm just trying to think of all the people like, these people, people can do it, so can I. Brian's claim that he's not inspired by serial killers is somewhat undermined by that last remark. The following part of the video is redacted, but we know from the transcript that Brian tells the detectives that his nickname in high school was Jeffrey Dahmer. He says he had a reputation that he would become a serial killer. 
when we would do different group activities, sometimes we would have like different personas or whatever. Uh-huh. And you'd be like, I'll be Jeffrey. I'm like, no, you're not. I do remember that specifically. He was very obsessed with Jeffrey Dahmer. And is it Dylan Klebold, the Columbine shooter, was obsessed with him. I remember actually talking to my mom and saying, take this name to your prayer group. I mean, and I remember talking to another teacher and saying, if any kid's going to shoot at Fruit of Monument, it's this kid. In an interview, Brian's high school friend Patrick Rohor recalls the Halloween party they both attended. Do you remember a costume that he wore? Yeah, he wore a Jeffrey Dahmer costume. Okay, um, and I heard he was also he was Mike Myers one year. Was that he was actually he, Jeffrey Dahmer? Does that? I might have been mixing up the years because there was we had a couple of Christmas okay. parties, but I or uh, sorry Halloween parties, but yeah, I think he like dressed up as a serial killer, killer a couple of times. When he was, I guess Jeffrey Dahmer, how would how did that look? I guess how how did his costume look? I mean, it was like jeans, a plaid shirt, and like big glasses, which honestly was like not too entirely different from what he normally wore. His obsession with crime, serial killers, and all things morbid was something that his parents had noticed, too. A lot of perspective of separation on crime and crime scenes. And so he's talking about going into the military in the fall, and when he gets out, having your job. And so I had purchased online a crime scene investigation book for him. You know, it's like one that they could be probably read it when you first started out in college. And so I gave that to him and I was like, so here, Brian, you know, let's channel that curiosity into something positive that you can affect a good change in the world. And he's like, yeah, that's my plan, Mom. I'm not going to say always had a fascination. You know, I'm going to say in the last few years. And is it like shows that he watches or like tries to do things just to create a scene, you know what I mean? Like, whether it's like animal stuff or um, nothing Now like we love our dogs, okay. you know? I mean, he's very affectionate with our animals. And, you know, he would watch, you know, like just, just last week, he watched Silence of the Lambs. But I was like, well, he's 19, what's your, you know? <laughs> we all watch that. I, I, I watched it. It doesn't make me a serial killer, you know? <laughs> right. And he watched... Zodiac killer over the summer a couple of times. Brian's affinity for Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't the only warning sign observed by his teachers. Like the first week of school, we had a meeting with all of his teachers and his case manager expressing the concerns that they had with him and also explaining some of his behavioral issues. Did anybody um, express that they had concerns he could be a serious safety issue or anything like that? Yes, I believe so. We were to keep a very close eye on him. And it's certainly very apparent early on that he was a very troubled person. In the 2019 school year, one of Brian's teachers found a notebook filled with a number of disturbing elements. So I remember, we I don't even remember who found, there was like a notebook, I don't know if it was part of a notebook check, my student teacher, another student, or somehow it got brought. And we had a meeting with like Officer Beaumont and the administration out at Fruita just because it had some obviously concerning stuff talking about like serial killer statistics and stuff. Like mm-hmm. he seemed to be kind of enamored with that. So that was kind of the, and they asked us, did we think he was like a threat to us or other students? And me and my student teacher didn't feel like he was going to do any harm to anyone on the school. So famous serial killers some information about yeah them. like yeah. kill counts and just stuff like that okay like, that's not entirely normal the disturbing contents of the book discussed by brian's teacher far exceed his initial portrayal within its pages lie numerous troubling entries detailing brian's fixation on serial killers and other disturbing topics among these brian has devised his own cryptic code or alphabet Furthermore, Brian's brief profiles of his favorite killers paint a grim picture of his unhealthy obsession with destruction and depravity. Additionally, he outlined plans for taking lives and holding strong opinions about his own purpose and actions. The book was also filled with quotes about his beliefs in neutral evil. One such quote read, A neutral evil villain does whatever she can to get away with. She's out for herself, pure and simple. She sheds no tears for those she kills, whether for profit, sports, or convenience. This is far from the only warning sign that emerged during his time at school. In December of 2018, Brian was arrested on assault charges when he hit another student with a homemade mace. When I had kids give speeches, I always told them to get do an attention getter. And so it was the day of his speech, and he wanted to go first. And he pulled out this 
Indiana Jones like whip that he fashioned out of masking tape. So the start of the speech, he kind of kept hitting the podium, of course everyone looked, and then he gave his speech. Then later that day, you know, he ended up beating or whipping one of our side by side developmentally disabled students at the bus stop. In early 2019, he was suspended after intentionally causing a student with PTSD to suffer a panic attack. In a subsequent meeting, school administrators conclude that Brian has a high potential for violence and presents a high risk for the school. However, despite being apprehended for his behavior and his several run-ins with the management at school, Brian's mother, Terry Cohey, has a strikingly different opinion about the incidents. When you talked about the school stuff and having lots of issues, what were the issues that they were having that made other kids not feel safe? He would make jokes that were not appropriate. He got suspended a few times, like, for behavior that wasn't acceptable, like this one girl that he knows very well. He knows that she has a lot of issues, and that loud noises frighten her. And so, you know, one of his school suspensions was when he came up to her in the hallway and clapped really loud next to her. You know, knowing that it would put her in a panic, and she cried, and we were like, yep, no, nope. you knew that would upset her, and you did it anyway. And he got suspended for a weapon, but it was, there was another boy who brought in nunchucks to school, on the school bus. And Brian was like, wow, cool. And I think this was in 11th grade. And so Brian was like, I think Brian had given out some candy to some kids on the bus. And so Brian was like, can I check those out? He's like, I'll bring you in so I could give me some candy. So Brian gave the kid candy, and the next day the kid comes on the bus with two sets of nunchucks. One are glass, and the other one, I guess they're like rubber. I don't know. I don't, I never actually saw them. He's like, I know I can't take the glass ones because I'd be in trouble for that. So he took the rubber ones, and he put them in his backpack. I don't know if it was in his backpack or in his jacket. There was some differentiating stories. So the teacher saw them and they said, what's that, Brian? And he was like, uh, nothing, you know? And so, Bob Omar, you know, he was like, you know, we have a prohibited weapon on school grounds. And I'm like, okay, well, what about the other kid that brought them in? And they said, that kid doesn't have the behavior issues that Brian has. And I'm like, oh, so you're punishing Brian because he has behavior issues. I see. So Brian went through probation and he completed it successfully. In fact, his father, Brian Cohe Sr., believed that his son was incapable of such violence. He's got friends he hangs around with, you know, respectable friends. Not friends that would ever, not those kind of friends. Sure. Clean, good friends. Okay. You know, the, 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 the worst they have is they play video games. They drink too much Pepsi. So we, we are thinking, we're doing good. Our kids are both doing good. They're, they're okay at school. They don't drink or smoke. So I didn't really have any, no warnings that this was going to happen, no. You know, he, he may say a cuss word once in a while. No, he's never, never hit anybody ever. Okay. He got in trouble for throwing a tape ball at school three or four years ago. Okay. And they, I think they, they wrote him up for it because it hit somebody. But the football players can nail it down with a football. But Brian, he just, and he got in trouble for that. He's never hit anybody. He's just like his dad. I mean, I've never been in a fight, man. I, I, I thought I just saw he was going to be a spinoff of me because he's nonviolent, but uh, he's not. He, I don't know what's going on now. But Brian often resorted to social media as an outlet to share his ideas. His dark thoughts were further reinforced by his posts on various social media accounts, pictures, and comments about his beliefs and mental health. His comments on Reddit were often on posts depicting mutilations and injuries. In an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, Brian wrote, I'm a 17-year-old nobody who is failing his classes. When someone posted asking about him, Brian answered, I have a counselor, but he assigned me to someone else because I was beyond his skill set. I'm also going to get a neuropsychological evaluation because of my irresponsibility. I can't really use any of my friends for support because they'd make fun of me. Uh, then we did have that meeting with uh, SRO, and Jeremy and I went in there and we briefed him on it. And I reiterated to him, I was like, this kid is really going to need some help in counseling right now. He's like, all the flags are up. In fact, even the Samaritan who helped him at the boat ramp on the evening he was dumping Warren's body, Kellen Pfeiffer, was at school with him and had a few things to say about Brian's behavior. 
I remember my friends kind of complained and one of my friends, Isaac, just did not like being in the same bus as him. He found him very obnoxious and he complained about him a few times to me. I never really took too much notice at the time. And he was like, dude, this kid won't shut up on the bus and he says the most inappropriate stuff. And I'm just like, yeah. And he was like, I just hate the kid. And uh, I never really, like I said, took much of a note because it was kind of like at that point, like, oh yeah, people are like that. You know, some people are just annoying. So give them your you know, what you've been thinking about and all the other things people have ever thought you wanted to be a singer from. The only thing about me for for a while I was willing to do anything, good or bad. That was years ago in school. I was willing to do anything, whether it be good or bad, just to gain notoriety, fame, influence. Brian's comments about fame hinted a possible motive, but we still don't know the ultimate reason behind his horrific actions. In the hopes of drawing that reason out of him, detectives now take him one more time through the story of the gruesome killing. And this time, we get details that are even more monstrous than what we've learned thus far. Did he see you? No, he was not woken up until I pulled the sheets back. I know this is going to be really fast. You pulled the sheets back. And he, before you stabbed him, did he see you? No. And I pulled the sheets back. I get on him. I got a knee. And then stab him. And he wakes up. He's, why are you doing? Why are you okay. doing? Yeah. And I think you stabbed him anywhere besides that. I know you said the neck a lot of times. How many times do you think? Did you count him? No. <laughs> I was going until he stopped. Okay. How many? Just... Best idea how many times? 30 or 40. Okay. You said the neck. You, besides cutting his arms off. Well, actually, it was a general assault. I was mainly targeting his neck because that was okay. the most vulnerable area. I was stabbing his head anywhere in that general area. I stabbed his head multiple times. How about his chest, his stomach? His chest, I stabbed once through the ribs. Which hand were you using? Right hand. It was his right ribs, and I just went. I sliced open his belly, carved up his leg. Not like I, I made several slices out of his leg. Why did you do that? I was just doing everything I thought of at the moment. Then I cut off his head. I gave him a Glasgow smile. What's that? A Joker smile. But why were you doing that? I suppose it was a frenzy. I was so excited, so rushed up on adrenaline and everything. Okay. Woo! <laughs> And um, I paused, and he said, why are you doing this? And I said, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Brian has used very little vulgar language up to this point in the conversation. Between that and the exactness of his quote, it's easy to believe that this is an accurate recollection. So let's talk about before you were sure he was dead. Well, did you stab him before he was dead? No way about the head and neck. Okay. When did you stab him in the chest? After he perished. Okay, and how did you know he perished? He let out a final gasp. Okay. And he um, he wasn't fighting later on. He was losing too much energy, blood loss. Okay. And he just finally gasped, and I needed to make sure I'm peace of mind. So I decapitated him, partially as for the hell of it. So let's try to go step by step. He says he stabbed him in the neck and the head while he's alive. Yes, I paused. We had a conversation where he said, why are you doing this? And I said, I felt like doing this for a long time. I continued. He, he uh, died, deceased, whatever you want to call it. And then I stabbed his ribs, opened up his belly, sliced his leg multiple times. Okay. He wrote him and then decapitated him, removed his hands, his joints. Did you derobe him before or after you opened his belly? After I opened his belly. So you cut through his clothes to open No, I lifted up his shirt and just... Okay. Which way did you go? I'm like a deer this way or like this way? No, this way across his belly. Okay. If what Brian has admitted to so far has not put a sick feeling in your stomach, the gory details to come will surely do so. He was very, didn't see his heart or anything? No, he was very thin. I thought about taking that. What else do you think he saw in his... What do you, I think, what do I, internally, what did you see? I saw his liver, his large and small intestine, and that's it. <sighs> Some of it was yellow. I was thinking about taking out his heart. I was thinking about crushing the ribs and okay. disemboweling him entirely. Okay. Did you disembowel him at all or just cut him open? I cut him open, but his organs spilled out by themselves when I was dumping him. Did you take anything besides his head, like anything internally? No. And how did you know it was his liver? I mean, you ever go hunting, or how do you know it's somebody's liver when you open them up? It's dark, purple, brownish. Okay. It's large. A 
up here. I just knew it was, I had taken anatomy and physiology. Okay. So I knew it was his That makes sense. I'm just curious if you've ever seen one before, you're just guessing, or I, I've seen some. These nauseating details are quickly followed by another shocking piece of information about the night in question. Did you take any pictures that night? Yes, but I deleted them okay. entirely. Where did you take the pictures? Um, after I killed him, I took a picture of him with okay. his hands, but I deleted all those because those are evidence. Okay. I don't know if you can find them. But when you say you deleted them entirely, that's an interesting statement. What do you mean by that? I removed them from my phone, deleted the pictures. Okay. okay. With some assistance from the U.S. Secret Service, investigators are able to extract the deleted photos from Brian's phone. Nonetheless, Brian's care in deleting the pictures once again show that he was highly interested in covering his tracks, showing us everything we need to know about his state of mind in the wake of this awful murder. Did you tell anybody about what you did before today? No, I haven't told anyone that I committed murder. Yet that very morning, Brian texted his friend Kylan Like, asking if he can come over to talk. Once at the house, Brian concocted a story that Kylan's husband, James Bailey, thought was ridiculous. What I remember, he came over, he was acting super weird, and he was like, I gotta tell you guys something. I think the police are trying to frame me for a murder. I found a body, I was like messing with it, and I got my car stuck in the river, and I had wiped blood that I had on my hand onto the car, and the tow truck guy saw it, and like, I think that they're gonna try to frame me. I thought that he was... I thought that, like I said, at most he had found one okay. and was just trying to be edgy because he found one or something like that, or even to the point where he could have just been making it all up just because, again, I didn't know him personally. I was planning to maybe keep a finger. Okay. Yeah, go that far again. Yeah. Line finger. That's small. Not that much space. It won't smell that much. Makes sense. You could keep. Brian has provided the detectives with everything they could possibly want to know about the murder. He's detailed the killing not once, but twice, and he's even revealed stomach-churning details about the disposal of the body. The one question that remains, however, is an enormous one. Why? And Brian's reason why is perhaps the most twisted aspect of all. You know, Brian, I have to ask, a lot of people that we have talked with, they're you know, silent. Well, they're just not as well-spoken. You're very articulate. You're very articulate. I think I'm bad with words. No, I actually think you're really articulate. And you you talked about you were just kind of in a bad space that night. It was, yes. Okay. Why were you in a bad space? I didn't take my medicine. And plus, for years, I was wondering what murder would feel like. Because you read Ted Bundy and the Zodiac. They all say murder is the best human in the world. So I'm like... I'm going to try that. So for some time, I had been wondering when it would happen. I always knew I would be in this building, whether it was as a criminal or a police officer. As shocking as it is that Brian's motivation comes down to a simple matter of sick curiosity, his last remark is almost more unbelievable. As mundane and evil as Brian's motive may seem, it's not one he made any attempt to hide. Even as he first talked to police in front of his house, the young killer was fully upfront about his curiosity. Like, for real human head and hands? Yes. From? That fellow who went missing recently. Which fellow was that? Warren Brown. Warren Brown? When did he go missing? The night of the 27th. Okay, and how did you end up with him? I murdered him. With what? A knife. Why would you have done that? I've always wondered what murder felt like. Brian's teachers were all asked an identical question. Um, when he, when Brian was arrested, were you surprised to hear that? No, I was not at all. You know, I remember when I saw the story on the news and, you know, you're like, that name sounds so familiar. And then you're like, I guess I wasn't surprised if that makes sense. I mean, I've been doing this for 23 years and I know you can't really go off gut feelings, but it just, I just always felt empty around Brian. Like there was, you know, and just like he needed much more help than we could offer him in a public school setting. And so when I saw that, I hated to see I wasn't necessarily surprised that his path could have led to that point. Were you surprised to hear about what happened on the news? No, I wasn't. I, w I was more let down by the system because like we had called it out that he needed help, like with all those kind of flags were going off uh -huh. and it still happened. Back in the interrogation, the detectives try to find out if Brian's curiosity was satisfied by the murder. So, to see what it felt like, what did it feel like? 
It was intense. It was a rush of adrenaline. My whole body was shaking. Not like out of fear. It was like... It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't fear. It was just pure... What's the word? Um, excitement, I suppose. Not excitement as in joy, just excitement as in increased heartbeat, mm -hmm. sweating, that type of thing. Like an adrenaline jump? Yeah. Although I wasn't breaking the sweat killing the guy. It was quite easy. Well, did you enjoy it or not enjoy it? Um, did I enjoy it? I don't know. Sort of neutral of the whole thing. I didn't enjoy it, but I didn't hate it. <laughs> if I go back to I probably wouldn't have done it knowing what it felt like, knowing how this will all turn out. I wouldn't have done it. What did you think it was going to feel like? I thought it would be the best feeling in the world. You said you didn't feel much of anything. Um, excitement. Oh, that's right. Okay. But other than that, no. Well, let us step out and figure out where we're going next, okay? Okay. The interrogation is over, and Brian seems highly satisfied with how he's cooperated with the detectives. He's enjoyed every minute of this conversation, and it seems that he at least partially achieved what he set out to do. He seems to see himself in the same league as infamous killers such as Ted Bundy. Brian may be done talking on camera, but he still has one last comment to make. According to Detective Berg's official report, when he walked Brian to the booking department, Brian smiled and said, I feel like Hannibal Lecter right now. Brian Cohey Jr. pled not guilty by reason of insanity in January 2022. This plea triggered a psychological evaluation. Noting the matter-of-fact way he presented the details of the murder, the doctors asked him how he felt about the killing in retrospect. Brian said, quote, Yeah, it's just kind of a thing that happened. It sucks, but it happened. When asked what about it sucks, Brian mentioned that he was now locked up, couldn't see his friends, and emphasized that he really missed video games and the internet. He did not, however, express any remorse for the victim. So I don't know what's going to happen now. I don't know how we've got to get some kind of advice or find out what to do. Because she has her own business here, and I have my own business, and I carry the same man's name as my son. Right. And, I, and now it's going it's to be all over the paper. Brian Cody killed somebody. Right now we can't do anything. Well, gonna, and, we can't go anywhere. We can't, I'm not working anymore. She can't have any more kids anymore. It's all, everything's over. It's all done now. It's over. Our lives are totally over. A jury ultimately rejected the insanity defense and found Brian Cohey Jr. guilty on one count of evidence tampering, two counts of tampering with a deceased human body, and one count of murder in the first degree. Because, I mean, I'm already going to jail for 15 years, probably. Contrary to Brian's estimations, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He's currently serving out his sentence at Buena Vista Correctional Complex in Colorado Springs. Monique Lanati reflected on how she would want her friend to be remembered. If I had to say one word about Warren, he was amazing. A permanent metal art memorial was installed next to Monique's bridal downtown, carefully crafted to reflect Warren Barnes' favorite pastime, reading books.